Now I'm going to try to touch on three things in tonight's talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Middle East Forum, but we could save that for the end of the discussion. But I want to answer three questions. Number one, what is the current U.S. policy towards the Middle East in a very broad sense? We'll start from Egypt, make our way to Lebanon, go over to Iran, make our way back to Saudi Arabia, up to Jordan, and then maybe lastly touch on Syria. That'll take about 15 minutes. Then we'll narrow in and zoom in on what are the domestic issues in the state of Israel right now. And we have to understand what Israel is facing as a country and as a polity and as a society in order to understand how the Trump administration and its positions will affect it internally. And the third thing we'll talk about is a five-part plan for how the Trump administration should be relating to Israel and kind of give maybe a 60 to 70 day report card on how they're doing so far. So just to begin, let us start with the Middle East. Now, who in this room has been to Israel before? How many people have been to Saudi Arabia? So there's maybe a little bit more context that we have to understand in terms of some of the other Arab countries. Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, anybody? So most of the news that you're probably getting is what you read in American newspapers, in English language ma media. Maybe some of you can read Arabic. Maybe some of you can read Hebrew and get the Israeli perspective. But I'm going to try to give you an honest assessment that's not full of partisanship in terms of the way that I see the Middle East. I'm not speaking on behalf of my organization or any of our analysts. This is just my opinion, and I think that that's a disclaimer that has to be mentioned before I get into my analysis. We right now have a cauldron that is about to erupt, not just in Syria, where we think that we're hearing from the American media that the war is over. In my opinion, that war has only begun because the destruction of ISIS means that they no longer control Mosul and Iraq and Raqqa and Syria. We forget about the franchising or what I call the McDonald's effect with ISIS in terms of their ideology being spread to the four corners of the Arab world and even beyond it. If we talk about Egypt, we look at a new dictator that is basically a president in a Democrat's, uh, Democrat's cloth. Now, he was elected, but he's on his way to a liberal democracy. This individual, though, is probably Israel's best Egyptian friend that we have had in history. If we look at Jordan, that's a country that we often do not talk a lot about, but if the United States passes a ban on the Muslim Brotherhood, what happens to half of Jordan's parliament? those that the ambassador, the American ambassador in Jordan relies on for being able to have cross-cultural and diplomatic communication, especially with members of Jordan's parliament. If we look at Lebanon, maybe you've heard that there was recently a newly appointed president. The parliament is back in shape. The constitution is actually running for the first time after, I think it was a three-year lapse. But we also see Hezbollah armed with 120,000 rockets. The fact that they may have these rockets doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to use them but they do have six years of battle-hardened experience, where before the Syrian civil war they were a terror organization, now they are a terror army. We often hear, if we remember from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, about the Saudi Arabian royal family paying families of suicide bombers ten dollars to $20,000 for each attack that was committed against Israel. But then we have the new Saudi deputy crown, uh, crown prince, Mohammed Salman, who was visiting Washington last week, calling Donald Trump the best friend of Muslims in the world, and even beyond that, now trying to pursue energy security and innovation cooperation with the state of Israel, even though it's through track to negotiations and diplomacy. Iran, a country that President Trump said that we were going to maybe not necessarily tear up what he called the worst deal ever, but the State Department proceeding, proceeding with business as usual. So while there's this cauldron that's about to boil over, there's an American administration right now that has stated what their policy positions are going to be, but only being two months into the administration, we don't know how that's playing out, especially when the main security threat, as has been announced by the National Security Council, that the U.S. is focusing on is North Korea, not the Middle East. But let's get started. Egypt right now is governed by an individual named Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He was a former head of the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, replacing Mohammed Tantawi, the individual responsible for helping throw out Hosni Mubarak, the former president of the state of Egypt. After the, the elections that took place between Ahmed Shafiq and Mohammed Morsi in 2012, we saw that a Muslim Brotherhood candidate was elected with 52% of the vote versus the 48% that went to the former candidate that was allied with Mubarak in a previous iteration of the Egyptian government. 
It only took a year for the Egyptians to launch the largest protest in human history, demanding for the ouster of Morsi. And in comes, at that time, the head of the armed forces and the defense minister, El Sisi, and a year later he becomes president of Egypt. Now, one would think that during the Obama years, which was somewhat partial towards the Muslim Brotherhood president, and I don't want to say they're partial to the Muslim, towards the Muslim Brotherhood, but they were trying through the ambassador to Egypt at that time, and then next the assistant secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Ann Patterson, uh, who was recently just withdrawn from her nomination as the number three in the Pentagon, they were trying to have a process of engagement. If anyone remembers President Obama's speech in 2009 at the University of Cairo, it was sort of what in, some individuals called a great apology tour. Other people who were more sympathetic towards his position were saying that he was trying to reconcile America's position with Middle Eastern countries after eight years of the Bush administration. But at the end of his administration, we saw that we had a pendulum go from Hosni Mubarak at the beginning, moving to the Muslim Brotherhood in the middle of his term, and going back to full Egyptian autocracy at the end. But El Sisi has made three mistakes that we don't hear a lot about. The first is, is that he's replaced his main labor force in the country, which goes on endemic strikes, almost in perpetuity, with the military. The Egyptian military is trained in two ways. Number one, how to fight wars, and number two, how to run factories. The spoil system assigned with the Egyptian government allows them to grant factories on a certain level. Every captain gets maybe one power plant. A major might get an uh, agricultural dispensary. A colonel might get a certain city and running that uh, part of what was literally a military industrial complex. You even get to the point of the absurd where you have Egyptian military volunteers, not volunteers, but conscripts, manufacturing diapers and baby milk. Now, by replacing his economic assets, he has created a vacuum with Egyptians who are now frustrated with him. The second thing that he did was he thought that in a position of power for a three or four year period after he became president of Egypt, he could start creating alliances with other Arab countries to start financing the Egyptian deficit which is ever growing. He built an $8 billion addition to the Suez Canal which has not generated any way near that amount in revenue. He relied on billions of dollars in loans from Saudi Arabia and in return gave two islands in the Straits of Tehran back to the Saudis that they had given to, at that time in the, in the early 1950s, to the Egyptian government. And it was met with uproar from the Egyptian people. And the last thing that he did, which was a, a great fallacy, and not fallacy, but a great folly, was he did not deal with ISIS in the Sinai Peninsula or uh, Ansar Beit al-Makdis, which is ISIS's affiliate in Sinai. Roughly 800 fighters who have downed the Russian passenger jet caused chaos for the Egyptian armed forces in Sinai and probably are the third greatest threat to the state of Israel and probably the first greatest threat to the state of Egypt in that region across the peninsula. So he's gone so far with these policies that the reactions that he's had to generate have brought him closer to the Saudis. They've brought him closer to the Israeli government. It was almost as if though the, law of, the rule of unintended consequences or Murphy's law in this situation made him a greater ally of Israel. On the first issue, dealing with the economy, he's now relying on Israeli gas reserves to start powering Egyptian power plants, where it was the reverse. The Egyptians used to export oil to Israel. On the second issue, in terms of being able to deal with loans and Egyptian sovereignty, he now has declared the Palestinians enemies of the Egyptian people. Where at one time, even before Mubarak was thrown out of office, Egypt was seen as sort of the penultimate medium between the Israelis and the Palestinians. If we remember the names of some negotiations, Sharm el-Sheikh, the Cairo Accords, el-Sisi is no longer on the Palestinian side. He has gone so far to raise 8,000 houses on the Gaza-Sinai border because the ISIS members in Sinai that are fighting against members of the Egyptian military are using Gaza as a bed and breakfast to rehabilitate in between their reigns of jihad. And on a third point, in terms of not just fighting the insurgency but trying to seek regional cooperation, Sisi, who was sort of like a little bit ambivalent on the way that he was dealing with Syria, has thrown his cards in with the regime in Damascus, while at the same time opposing Iran. So if we're not confused yet, I hope to get you guys a little bit more weary of what's going on in the region, and hopefully we'll bring it back to what's going on with the rest of the Middle East. We now move our way over to Saudi Arabia, which we touched on in terms of the loans that they provided to Egypt itself. 
Now, Saudi Arabia is in the middle of a great transition. We see that for the first time the kingdom is recognizing that after year after year of oil revenues going down, that they have to diversify their economy. Has anyone, has anyone here work on Wall Street? You're better off. No, I was going to say you're better off, but, you know, good luck. Uh, but in all seriousness, we might have the largest Arab initial public offering or IPO coming up in the next few months with 5% of the Saudi, oil, the Saudi national oil company, Aramco, being offered, and it depends on what market. I don't know if the New York Stock Exchange is going to get it. Maybe London and the Mercantile Exchange will get it too. But this will inject, in the hopes of the Saudis, $100 billion into a newly created sovereign wealth fund to start helping the Saudis train up to understand different industries that might be able to start investing in Jeddah and in Riyadh and other major Saudi cities. And even going beyond that, offering the next generation of Saudi citizens a hope beyond working in the oil fields or trying to get to be close to the royal family. Now, there's a lot of amb the ambivalence also with this position, because even if the Saudis get this amount of money, there's not enough trained individuals in the kingdom to know what to do with it. Now, Saudi Arabia's problem doesn't just emanate from its economy. It's also mired in the middle of three civil wars that are going on right now. It has missions that they're flying with six other Arab Gulf countries uh, in Yemen, where they're basically fighting a proxy war against the Iranians with the Houthis, which are a Shia minority. Every know, everyone knows the difference between Sunni and Shia. Shia, let's call that the Iran axis. Sunni, we'll call that everybody from Morocco up to about southern Iraq. They're engaged in a proxy war where you have Scud missiles being launched from Yemen on Saudi cities and Saudi fighters and Saudi-backed militants, not militants, but the Yemen army, or what the UN recognizes as the Yemeni army, having a blockade and causing humanitarian disaster in a country south of its border. The second civil war it's engaged in is in Syria. The Saudis are, with the Qataris, the main financiers of the Islamists. There's four factions that are active in Syria. They're the main backers of one of the four factions that are active there. And the more money and resources that the Saudis spend outside of their borders, the less likely this IPO and their uh, diversification of their economy is going to result in success. And the third civil war, which some people wouldn't agree with me that it's a civil war that's going on right now, is in Lebanon where it may not necessarily be a kinetic conflict, but for the past 11, 12 years, since the Syrians were thrown out of Beirut during the Cedar Revolution in 2005, you have this, these two polarities, Iran trying to back the Hezbollah and, and certain elements of the Christian community in Lebanon, and the Saudis trying to provide major loans to Beirut banks and to Lebanese Sunnis backed by a man named Rafiq Hariri in the March 14th coalition and other allies like the Druze, smaller minority, a guy named Walid Jamblat. Doesn't necessarily have to mean anything to you, but hopefully maybe for this audience it might. We'll see uh, what we do with this video a little bit later on. And while the Saudis are involved in these proxy conflicts, they cannot spend the kind of attention that they have to on their own borders. And the major overarching threat to Saudi Arabia, beyond its internal problems and the wars it's involved in close but beyond its borders, is Iran. Now, just like the Egyptians found themselves closer to Israel as a result of the rule of unintended consequences, or Murphy's Law, we see that the Saudis now are sending delegations of businessmen, of former generals, of think tankers, going to meet Israeli officials, not just in Washington, D.C., or in European capitals, but sending delegations to Israeli academic conferences and to business uh, forums, where the Saudis are starting to make inroads of opening up to the state of Israel. Doesn't make up for any of the previous fouls that they had done, but I'm just asking you to think about how that context, and we're going to return to, to the defense minister's statement, Salman, where he said that Trump was the best friend of the Muslims in, in the global community, and link that to Israel. We'll move really quickly to Oman, Qatar, Kuwait, the UAE, all countries which are involved in one way or another with the Palestinians and to a lesser extent Israel. What's going on is basically, uh, 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 I guess the best way to put it would be uh, uh, sort of, um, I'm missing the uh, you know, sort of an internal conflict between Arab peoples. Every country along the Gulf has their own Palestinian faction at their backing. 
In the UAE, they're backing Mohammed Dalan, the former commander of Fatah and Palestinian Authority forces in Gaza. In Qatar, they're close with Hamas, since they have a base that's located there. In Kuwait, they're backing another Palestinian faction, still having some sort of erstwhile support for Abbas and his family. And even in Oman, they're acting as a middleman between Palestinian factions that are fighting one another. If we make our way up to Iraq, not really so involved right now with Israel, but they do have their own interests in terms of who wins the war for Iraq. If Prime Minister Abadi and the Iranian-backed Shia militias that are right now the main force fighting against ISIS in the north of that country clash with the Syrian, excuse me, the Kurdish forces that are in the three provinces in the northernmost part of Iraq, the winner between the Kurds and the Shia, with the Sunnis having largely been defeated because not saying that they all back ISIS, but they are the odd man out in this tri-patriot conflict. The winner of that conflict between the Shia and the Kurds, and I will tell you this, I'll make a prediction, there will be a fight between the Iraqi government forces and the Kurdish-backed semi-autonomous government in the three northern provinces of Iraq, will turn their guns towards Israel. If it's the Kurds, they're more likely to be friendly to the Jewish state. If it's the Shia, what you have is now Iranian access from the border between Iraq and Iran, making all their way through Anbar province to the Jordanian border. And even if we look up at a 45 degree angle to the northwest of the country, when we get to the Syrian-Iraqi border, we end up finding ourselves right now with a six faction fight going on, two of them in Iraq, four in Syria, that at the end of the Syrian civil war and the Iraqi ISIS insurgency, do you think they're just going to drop their arms and say kumbaya and make sure that everybody's happy? No. They'll find a new enemy if they can't find with one within their own community to fight, and that may be Israel. So now we've made our way from Egypt. We kind of went all the way around into a crescent, and we stopped in Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, and then we'll talk about the second part, Israel's domestic challenges. Turkey right now is on the verge of a referendum which, if passed, a change to their constitution will give almost ultimate power to Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the current president of Turkey. Everyone read in the news about the issue between the prime minister of the Netherlands and Erdogan, where the Netherlands ejected a Turkish minister from Rotterdam, and then Germany also followed up with a similar step, banning Turks from having a rally, trying to get support from Turkish expats in the Netherlands and in Germany to vote on this constitutional referendum. Erdogan said today, as a result of this increasing conflict, not just between Holland and Germany and Turkey, but between Europe and Turkey, that every European walking on the streets should look behind his back. Erdogan has used rhetoric in comparing the Dutch and the Germans, to Nazis. It's a way for the kettle to call itself black. But at the same time, where Erdogan is trying to gain almost full power and political autonomy, he has purged his country after the July 16th attempted coup, or the middle of July attempted coup, but he got it wrong by a day or two. Akadim, 1,500 deans were fired from Turkish universities. All the major press, from Cumhuriyet to other major newspapers in Turkey have no longer been operating because they've been shut down by the government or they've been forced out by AKP backed or AKP, that's Erdogan's party, and their ownership. The military has lost an entire generation of middle and higher officers, except for a few that went along with the AKP. The peace negotiations that were going on between the PKK, that's the Turkish uh, Kurdish insurgents that have been fighting a 33-year-long war against the government in Ankara ended. And Erdogan has even gone so far as to trying to use the same skills that he used in suppressing democratic forces that opposed him in his own country, and he's using the same tactics beyond his borders. Erdogan might be an internal genius when it comes to Turkish politics, but when he starts meddling overseas, that's when he gets in trouble. I just point to an instance of him shooting down a Russian fighter jet over Turkish airspace, and it was arguable whether it was over Syrian or Turkish airspace a year ago, and the resulting 
sanctions that Russia passed against Turkey, which almost crippled the Turkish economy. But here's the rub and the silver lining that's in the middle. While Turkey is now going to at least a rhetorical war with Europe, for some reason, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel and his cabinet, has reconciled with Turkey after almost seven years of being in a diplomatic wilderness, after the Mavi Marmara, the flotilla incident that happened between Israel and the Turkish government. So, on one hand, you have Turkey on its way towards dictatorship. It's fighting with Europe. It is now reconciled with Russia and just recently had negotiations between the Iranians, the Syrians, the Russians, and the Turks without any European or American involvement. And Israel is saying, let's get a closer relationship. We'll put context to that in the last part of the analysis. Lebanon, we already kind of talked about it a little bit. Basically, the main thing you have to know about it is, is that while the country may have just reached a reconciliation between the Shia Hezbollah forces, the Maronites, the Christians, or Maronite Catholics, Christians, whatever way you want to characterize them, the Druze, and the Sunnis, insofar as conflict continues in Syria and Iraq, the hotter it gets in Syria, the more it'll get in Lebanon. As soon as the conflict in Syria ends and Hezbollah returns its army to within Lebanon's borders, if they ever actually do that, because they're not needed by the Assad regime to maintain the quiet, violent control that they have over southern Syria, you will not just see 140, 150,000 Hezbollah rockets from the Mediterranean Sea to Mount Hermon, where Syria, Lebanon, and Israel's borders meet, but you will see Iranian and Lebanese Hezbollah bases on the Golan Heights. Now, I said I would save Syria for last because that's the entry point of how we get into Israel. Four main factions exist there right now, and for some of you who were at the talk earlier, I'll do it a little bit more abbreviated rather than trying to go into it. We could save it for Q&A. You have the Kurds. Now, the Syrian Kurds are not Turkish Kurds. They're not Iranian Kurds. They're not Iraqi Kurds. And why is that important? Because the ones in northeastern Syria right now are not of a democratic bent like the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan is. They're not based on hierarchical connections like the Kurdish Democratic Party is. Those are the two main forces that exist in the Kurdish autonomous areas of Iraq. They are not the Iranian Kurds who are more interested in smuggling cigarettes and illegal alcohol into Iran and live sort of a nomadic lifestyle. They are essentially Marxist rebels fighting for a unified Kurdistan within Syrian borders that are more connected to the PKK, the Turkish Kurdish, Turkish Kurdish terrorist group, than they are to any of the other Kurdish factions. And it's important to know this because the US's main ally in Syria is a Marxist terrorist organization. That's how absurd the world has become. Even though they may have a different ideology that's almost counterintuitive to US values and the exact opposite, or diametrically opposed to what we believe as a country, what we say we believe as a country and what our values are, they're our most effective partner on the ground. There's an example of real politique in 2017, that's it. You also have Islamists. This is everybody who ranges from the very, very uh, uh, still conservative but moderate uh, Syrian rebels that comprise this, the Free Syrian Army, all the way to Jabhat al-Nusra, which is once upon a time Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Syria, to the Hizbat uh, al-Shib, HTK, it's Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Syria. You have a third faction, which we all know about from the news, ISIS. But even though ISIS is maybe the most feared according to American media, they're only responsible for about 6% of the deaths that have occurred in Syria. So when you see hundreds of thousands of Syrians that have been killed, you might attribute it to ISIS because of the fear that's coming out of American media. But in actuality, the fourth faction, which is the Assad regime, backed by Russia and its air power, backed by Iran and its training of Afghani and Pakistani and Iranian and Syrian Shia militias, and Hezbollah, another Iranian-backed Lebanese proxy, all fighting together, is responsible for over 90% of the deaths in Syria itself. And this is why, if anyone picked up a copy of the New York Times today, they would see a picture of a Syrian Islamist sniper firing into Damascus that the Syrian narrative has been broken. 
The Assad regime said that they were on the verge of winning the war in Syria after they kicked out rebel forces from Aleppo. What happened in actuality was the rebels regrouped. They went down along the eastern border of the country and they came up into the Damascus suburbs launching a new offensive against Assad in the heartland of his control. Other offenses were also started in Hama, another Syrian city, and also in the Golan Heights. So while Assad fights three different or two different rebel factions and the Kurds march towards ISIS-controlled territory in Raqqa, the conflict is nowhere near over. Because if you have four sides and one side beats another side, that's another two or three that you have to still deal with. And in the end analysis, Israel is still left facing at least one of three or four enemies that want to see it destroyed. So going there now, we have to look at the state of Israel itself. Probably do that for another seven minutes. We'll do seven minutes of Trump, and then we'll open up to questions and answers. I don't want to get too bogged down in the rest of the Middle East. So we find ourselves now at Israel. The Israeli government is going through a period of domestic tumult that has not seen since, I would argue, Netanyahu's first ascension to the prime minister to the, to the prime ministership from 1996 to 1998. He had his second term shortly after Barack Obama was elected. He had his third term right around uh, Obama's re-election. And he had his fourth term a year prior to Obama leaving office. Netanyahu promised the Israeli people that with the new elect, newly elected Donald Trump in office that everything would be different. You saw many Israeli conservative centrists and then moving further to the right individuals saying this is a new era for U.S.-Israel relations. But I think that what you'll see after I go through this analysis is that it's almost business as usual. Netanyahu right now is the subject of three separate investigations into alleged corruption that could end up toppling his coalition. He has also entered into a fight over the Israeli uh, uh, public broadcaster, which is basically, like we have PBS here. There's also Rashut Shidur in Israel, which is the public broadcasting agency. So he's fighting with one minister, the minister of finance on that. He's engaged in another fight right now with the head of the Jewish Home Party, a man named Naftali Bennett, over the amount of settlement construction that can actually go in the wake of his negotiations with Trump. He's actually doing okay with the defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, who replaced a, another Likud lawmaker, the, Lieberman's from the Israel Beitenu party, but he's engaged in a bitter battle between Moshe Ya'alon, the former defense minister, and the current defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, arguing what's the best way to keep Israel safe. And that's just within his own coalition. We go beyond that, and we look at Yeshatid, led by Yair Lapid, the major opposition party. He's beating him in the polls by three or four seats. We look at the Labor Party, always, always uh, losing nuisance, but still an ever-present nuisance to the Likud. And other corruption investigations, which threaten the stability of his ministers, from the welfare minister, Chaim Katz, and the Israel uh, 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 Aerospace Industries, IAI, uh, 14,000 employees strong. This is the manufacturer of some of Israel's most advanced weapon systems. The subject of a police raid yesterday where 14 employees were arrested. That doesn't even go beyond what's happening in his own co within his own party, where you have members of the Likud starting to talk about the return of Gideon Sa'ar, a former what's called a Likud prince, one of those that came up during the time of Ariel Sharon and Menachem Begin. Actually, Sa'ar was way after Begin. But... They can smell blood, the political sharks in Israel in their water, and we even, haven't even started to talk about the security issues that Israel faces. So that's what's going on in politics. In terms of what's going on with Israel just as a people, you have thousands of ultra-Orthodox right now protesting on the main entryway into Jerusalem because they don't want their sons and daughters to go into the Israeli army to comply with new draft restriction, or with new draft legislation that was put forward. You have a battle of culture going on right now, where you have the recognition of Israeli poets and artists and playwrights that are trying to have their shows contained just to the 1948 borders of Israel and not to go beyond into Judea and Samaria to play in Israeli and, and Jewish towns in the West Bank, causing a rift within the artistic community. And even on BDS, 
Israelis cannot agree to the extent of whether or not they will ban, disallow, or eject supporters of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement from coming into Israeli airports. So there's all these different issues that are really bubbling at the surface, but the good thing about Israel is that during a time of existential crisis, they band together. We just don't know when that's going to happen. In fact, and this is something that came up in the talk earlier, the only existential crisis that Israel is facing right now, according to the, former, the most recent former director of the Mossad, is a binational state. Now, my personal opinion is, Israel doesn't need any more Palestinian Arabs. So anyone who argues that we should absorb or annex or declare sovereignty over the totality of 100% of Judea and Samaria is making a mistake because they forget what comes along with it. Now moving to the Palestinians, which I intentionally ignored. Really quick. Hamas has gone through a political revolution in the last three months during a new election for their Shura Council or their Politburo. You have a leader of Hamas in Gaza, a man named Yassin War, who has essentially declared that it is his policy to do whatever it takes to not just eject any Israeli influence over Gaza, but to eject any Israeli influence over what he calls Palestine. It's not just him saying, based on his 20 years in Israeli jail after having been found guilty of murdering 12 Palestinian collaborators, and he was actually released in the Shalit deal. That shows you what happens when we release terrorists. But his election is a meeting of a once, and I don't want to call it moderate, but let's like call it moderate for Hamas, okay? It's should we launch two or four rockets today? That's the difference between these political forces. So Sinwar is saying that the, the, the political operatives within Hamas that control the welfare organization, this is the hospitals, this is the charitable funds, this is the, the job training programs, this is the Hamas who puts uh, their employees working in United Nations facilities in Gaza, saying that they have to get closer to the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, the military wing of Hamas. And when the politicians agree with the military and they say that their joint strategy is to inflict pain on Israelis, the next step is the fourth Gaza-Israel war. Not something that I'm looking forward to. When we get to the Palestinian politics in Judea and Samaria or in the West Bank and the Palestinian towns from Nablus and Janina in the north to Jericho and Hebron in the south, we see right now that after the recent Fatah Central Committee elections that Abbas has actually appointed a successor. Mahmoud Abbas, elected president to a four-year term in 2005, now serving the 12th year term of his four-year term in 2017, is not getting any younger. He's suffering liver disease. He has kidney failure in his right side, according to Israeli intelligence reports. And he realizes that he is no longer immortal, just like Arafat realized a little bit too late that he wasn't immortal either. When Abbas goes, there will be a violent uprising within the Fatah party. Not just of central committee member against central committee member, because they will not commit violent attacks against one another. What they will do is show who is the more violent entity or faction of the Fatah party, or larger the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, by directing their guns towards Israel. You have more credibility on the Palestinian street, not by how many jobs you bring to a family or to a certain district or governate within the Palestinian Authority controlled territories, but how long you've served in an Israeli jail, how many individual Israelis you were responsible for killing, or how many terror attacks were planned and perpetrated under your leadership. And when we look then at the sort of duality between Hamas putting pressure on Israel from Gaza and Fatah, not now, but in the near future, finding themselves on the verge of a leadership crisis after Abbas goes, that will only lead to kinetic conflict with Israel. I hope I'm wrong. So with all of this being taken into consideration, where does Donald Trump stand on the Middle East, and more specifically, his Israel policy? During the election campaign, we saw him start with his speech to AIPAC almost one year ago today, declaring that he, there would be no greater friend of the state of Israel other than Donald Trump. We saw that in his national security speech on August 15th of 2016, he went further and made more security 
uh, he elaborated more on security measures of what he would do for the state of Israel itself. Even going beyond that, the first thing that he did in terms of his Twitter diplomacy as it was engaging vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations Security Council was he tweeted his disappointment with UN Resolution 2334, which President Obama decided that the United States should abstain from, which condemned Israeli settlement construction and set its borders according to the pre-1967 lines. But from the moment that Trump took office, what he said he would do versus what he has done is something that requires further analysis. The first statement on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Israel-Arab conflict writ large that the White House put out was about 10 to 11 days after Trump came into office where the White House condemned planned settlement construction in the wake of the demolishing of a Israeli, illegal Israeli settlement called Amona. Netanyahu promised to build a new settlement. The White House said, no, no, don't do that. The second thing was Jason Greenblatt, the new White House envoy for international negotiations and his trip to Israel. He met with Netanyahu, he met with Abbas, he met with other Israeli officials. He even went so far to meet with the leaders of all of Israel's different religious sects, the first time that the heads of all the different religious affinity groups in Israel met since 2003. When he met with the diplomats, he took his kippah off. When he met with a non-governmental organization, he put his kippah back on. But there's a certain amount of folly in appointing a New York real estate attorney in charge of the nations, not the nations, but one of the uh, globes in the world's longest running unsolvable conflicts. Uh, Greenblatt has a lot to learn. The other thing which just came out in the news today is what President Trump's White House is asking of the Israeli government as it relates to the conflict. The first proposal that Greenblatt put on Netanyahu's desk was as follows. He asked that Netanyahu have a settlement freeze in any isolated Jewish communities that go beyond major Jewish residential blocks in Judea and Samaria. He also asked that Netanyahu put a quota on the amount of houses that could be built starting in Ariel in the north, going down to Kiryat Arba in the south, including Ma'ale Abdumim and the Gush Etzion block, or the Etzion block. The one thing that he might have given, which is good, is unlimited Jewish construction in East Jerusalem. What he asked of the Palestinians has not been reported yet. But I would be remiss to say that a recent State Department appointment, a man named Michael Ratney, one of the architects of the Iran deal, Obama's last envoy to Syria, and as of a week ago, the new State Department coordinator for the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, has had a certain amount of influence over this new administration. Extending beyond that, we have to look at the security cooperation that was promised during the campaign between Trump and Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Trump promised to look at the Iran deal. He called it the worst deal ever, but he didn't say what he was going to do about it. And analysts like myself are still waiting to see what the Trump administration will do regarding Iran. The one thing he did do, which was good, was he put sanctions and slapped sanctions back on Iran after a, missile took after a missile test took place in early February. But I haven't heard a peep on it since. As it relates to President Trump's plan for Syria, the still unannounced plan, but we see elements of it bubbling to the surface. He has deployed U.S. Marines within Syria itself, now taking part in direct action against ISIS elements. On the other side, he is sending Secretary of State Tillerson to Ankara, to the uh, Turkish capital in a few days, looking at trying to warm relations with Turkey rather than condemning them for their path towards dictatorship. Positively, he is engaged with President El Sisi of Egypt and with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, but he has also been making musings of negotiating with the Russians in terms of accepting their new hegemony in Lebanon and in Syria. I think that this leads now to the five points that I would recommend of what President Trump should do as it relates to re-strengthening our relationship with Israel. The first is he has to declare war on the BDS movement. Any political movement within the United States 
or internationally that seeks to deny Israel's right to exist as a free, sovereign, and recognized Jewish state should be condemned. President Trump should continue with the legislation that was passed during the Obama years and continue trying to find ways to sanction BDS back to itself. The second thing it should do is to whatever extent possible, try to repeal UN Resolution 2334. Now, I doubt that this will happen until Trump is able to build enough international clout, but he should make it US policy to punish UN bodies that comply with the resolution, to punish those who voted for it in a way that they then reciprocate their policies to be more friendly towards Israel, and even going beyond it to declare that he should not fund any UN agency that seeks to recognize a sovereign Palestinian state until the Palestinians recommend a sovereign Israeli state. The third item that I believe that he should do is to ensure that Palestinian leaders accept Israel's right to exist. There's been two schools of thought as it's related to U.S. peacemaking since 1973. Once again, you're going to hear this ad nauseum. One has been negotiations. They say it's a peace process. I would call it a war process. After every failed negotiation, more Israelis and Palestinians die. It gets the sides nowhere closer to one another. The second is unilateral concessions. This was the main theme behind the Obama administration's policy towards Israel. Do a settlement freeze, the Palestinians will come to the table. That didn't happen. Why don't you try to give some unilateral concessions to the president of the Palestinian Authority? Give economic cooperation measures and maybe they'll come to the table. I think Abbas and Netanyahu met for a total of three hours over eight years of Obama peacemaking. The onus should now be on the Palestinians to accept the idea of there being a Jewish state, something that Israel recognized for the Palestinians, I don't know in what form it would be, a long time ago. Israel needs to win, the Palestinians need to lose and accept Israel as a Jewish state. Fourthly, Palestinian incitement to terrorism should not be rewarded by U.S. international aid dollars. And countries that provide money to Palestinian Authority agencies and departments to basically give salaries to terrorists should no longer have U.S. cooperation. And fifthly, this is the last point, and then we can get to questions and answers. The U.S. Embassy should be moved to Jerusalem. It's not just a statement of Israel having its capital finally recognized by a major Western power, but it's an affirmation of a campaign promise that will show that the U.S. is serious, that when it says something, it will follow through with action. Those are my five recommendations for how President Trump can get the Israelis and Palestinians closer together to making the ultimate deal like he wants. But as I showed you in my first uh, 20 to 30 minutes of analysis, it's going to be a pretty hard task for him to try to do that. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, now I'll open up for questions. The question was, uh, is it true that the United States government provides aid to a UN refugee agency, I believe you're referring to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Administration, that then alleviates the, Gazan, uh, the Gaza government, Hamas basically, from having to provide services to its own people and freeing up their funds to wage war on Israel? Uh, there's two answers that I can give to you in a good Jewish way. Uh, the first is, or I can answer your question with a question. What is UNRWA's purpose in Gaza? Why do they exist? Why have Western governments and backers of the United Nations Relief and Works Administration been providing almost infinite aid to this agency that was set up in 1950, 1949, 1950, to only help the Palestinians for a few years? How has an agency dealing with one specific refugee population been able to exist for almost 70 years when every other refugee population in the world has only one agency to deal with it, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNRWA and UNHCR. The first answer I'll give to you is this. The Israeli government wants UNRWA active in Gaza. It's in the interest of Israel right now, or at least they think it's in their interest, to have a UN agency provide a sense of stability for Gazans so that Israel doesn't have to provide those services. Because in your question, you offered a logical analysis and an answer to itself. Hamas isn't interested in providing services to those Palestinians living in Gaza. Its modus operandi is waging war on Israel. So it can use, in terms of UNRWA, a hedge to provide certain services to Gazans. And on the other end, the Israelis use 
the UNRWA as a hedge in making sure that they don't have to reoccupy the strip. So its own utility continues from both sides of Hamas and Israel. The larger question of UNRWA's existence is what does it do for the peace process? The normal international definition of a refugee, according to American law, is the following. You are not a refugee if you are a second or third generation descendant of someone who was one. You are not a refugee if you have a residency in an established polity, meaning that I live in Jordan, I'm a Jordanian citizen, I can't be a Palestinian refugee. The third is that if you do not have uh, a, another citizenship or another nationality and you have a permanent place, for instance, you live in Gaza, you are no longer a Palestinian refugee. So UNRWA allows Palestinians to become fifth and sixth generation Palestinian refugees. As the president of my organization, Daniel Pipe, says, eventually all of us will be Palestinian refugees. UNRWA, while still meeting the needs of the Israeli government, I could care less about the needs of Hamas, needs to change its fundamental direction from being a refugee assistance agency to being a humanitarian aid agency. We can eliminate the Palestinian right of return or limit it from the six million right now of what UNRWA considers to be Palestinian refugees to maybe 30,000 to going back to that original definition of, an, of, 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 a, of what a Palestine refugee or what a refugee is by having it comply with American law. So let's change the American assistance going to Palestinian refugees to Palestinians in need. And by doing that, you solve the Israelis' qualms with it and you solve the eventual final status negotiation issue with it too. Hope I answered your question. Yes, uh, the question was, how confident am I in the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East? Let's break it down into departments. You have seasoned hands at the head of the Defense Department, at the Department of Homeland Security, which does have a role in certain dealing with domestic threats emanating from the Middle East, at the CIA with Mike Pompeo, and even at the State Department with Tillerson. He may not have been a diplomat, but he has decades of experience of dealing with other uh, foreign governments. One of the main issues with those appointments is that they have no one under them. You have a Deputy Secretary of Defense right now that is a carryover from the Obama administration. You only have one other political appointment in the State Department, and that's UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. At DHS, they're starting to fill up. There's four uh, Deputy Secretary slots, but there's still a hiring issue that's going on. So on appointments, I'm a little bit worried because they haven't staffed up yet. When it comes to the policy-making body and the National Security Council, which doesn't just coordinate U.S. national security policy towards the Middle East, but also is responsible for formulating the ideas and making sure that the different departments execute it, I'm a lot more confident. Now, some people might argue that the National Security Advisor, uh, McMaster, uh, coming from a background of working under the Petraeus coin or counterinsurgency strategy where he encouraged cooperation between moderate elements on the Syrian uh, Iraqi border when he was charged with uh, expelling Al Qaeda in Iraq from Tel Afar. It's a city, it's an Iraqi city that's on the Iraqi Syrian border. And then coming in to uh, the White House and, and trying to argue with President Trump, saying, You can't say radical Islam because Islam's not the enemy. I think that's polyoptics, it's political optics. But when you look at the other counterbalances that are in the White House, that being of Steve Bannon who I don't think is an enemy of the Jewish people. I don't think he's anti-Israel, and I think he has good intentions. He's just coming from a world of politics, which many of us find to be revolting. Doesn't mean he's a bad guy. <laughs> Can't blame the guy for his occupation. Uh, Steve Miller, uh, Sebastian Gorka, which has all, who, who has also undergone a lot of attacks, but he's truly not an anti-Semite. And then the more moderate camp of Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt, if they pursue a policy which is putting uh, the skids on what Obama was doing by decoupling the Iran deal, by putting Israel and its priorities before that of the Palestinians, by ensuring that America makes rational, pragmatic decisions in the Middle East that's good for American security interests rather than thinking of ideological interests, I think we'll be in a good place. So the policymakers are there, but those who execute policy have not been appointed yet. And if the bureaucrats who are responsible for the failed negotiations between the Israelis and Palestinians, like Ratney that I mentioned earlier, if 
the architects of the Iran deal are in senior acting positions in the State Department. If members of the Defense Department that were encouraging uh, sort of winding down the cooperation between U.S. and Israel security aid, and it's the bureaucrats that are running or, or executing the Trump administration's uh, policy goals, then I think we're in for a lot of trouble. So policy's correct. If the staff that's right there is now charged with implementing it, it'll be a failure. If they put staff in, it has a higher likely chances of success. Yes. So um, the question was, what is Russia's interest in Syria? First and foremost, Russia is not an enemy of Israel. Every six months, Netanyahu, his national security advisor and senior generals fly to Moscow and have security consultations with Vladimir Putin and other Russian national security staff. There's a mechanism that they've put in place which allows Israel to fly freely over Syrian skies up until this last uh, uh, aerial attack that took place against targets in Syria that has been existent for the last six years. Even before Russia really declared its entry into Syria, the Russians and the Israelis were coordinating. Russia also doesn't want to see Iran become the preeminent power in Syria. So that's one of the reasons why it will stay there. Russia's key interests in Syria are threefold. First, it allows them a naval port on the Mediterranean Sea, operating from Tartus, where they have a Russian naval base. It's been leased since the 70s. Second, from an area called Latakia, which allows them to have an air, uh, air capacity there to intervene in the Middle East. The second reason is it offers a southern hedge against Turkey. If you look at the uh, Ottoman-Russo wars going all the way back to the 1700s and 1800s, Turkey and Syria have always, excuse me, Turkey and Russia have always been at fisticuffs. Sometimes they're friends, sometimes they're not, but they always have been rival interests. It allows them to have a check against Turkey on their southern border, and by extension, a check against NATO in the Middle East. Even though Turkey's not really the most friendly NATO member right now to other NATO member countries. And the third thing it allows them to do is to distract from Russia's domestic problems. You know, there's three reasons why, uh, and I, I think that some members of our audience might affirm this, why members of the Russian public will go to the streets to protest. The first is a rise on the price of cigarettes. There was a uh, major um, protest in Vladivostok, Russia's most eastern city, after a cigarette tariff was introduced. The second is a rise on the tariffs on alcohol. And I'm not saying this because I'm trying to just offer a stereotype, but this is the way that it works within Russia. The third is, is if the Russian economy tanks and they don't have a external, uh, not scandal, an external conflict with which to focus their attention on. So if Russian nationalism is not being displayed and Russia's place in the world is not being affirmed, then the Russians lose out if they're not in being involved in protecting the first two interests and satisfying the third domestic one. Other people would disagree with that assessment, but that's my thought on, on why they're involved in Syria. So the other part of that analysis is, is that instead of offering carrots to the Palestinians, I think we should be offering more sticks. That the Palestinians and their century of rejectionism, not just against Israel, but against the idea of there being a Jewish presence in British Palestine then, State of Israel in 48, Greater Israel after 67, Israel contracted after the uh, Sinai negotiations, is that if you go so far to say that we will reward Palestinian transigence with more peace negotiations, the Palestinians have to understand that there's a deadline to their hesitancy and their stubbornness. And there's a price to pay if they continue on this current 100-year path of rejectionism. Now, I'm not calling for violence against the Palestinians. If you look at the tables of how you have the amount of Palestinians that accept the Jewish state versus those that reject it, there is a sizable minority that accept the idea of a Jewish state. But I want them from going from applauding suicide bombers and teaching their children to go and throw rocks at the low end, on the high end, to go stab Jews in Jerusalem, to go from a point where instead of promoting violence, their protest to an Israeli action that they disagree with will be a stern letter to the editor or a demarche to Jerusalem rather than encouraging violence. And if the Palestinians are not willing to educate their people and have, the go have their government push them in that direction, then the only other body that I think can do it is to force peace on the Palestinians by Israel getting stronger and tougher with them. 
Wars aren't won when one side wins. Wars are won when one side loses. The Palestinians have to lose in order to understand that the Jews are there to stay. If you want to find out more information about the Middle East Forum, go to www.meforum.org. Check out our annual uh, report that comes out every January and also our quarterly magazine, The Middle East Quarterly. Uh, I'm Greg Roman. Thank you very much. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.